God is good and all the time. God is good indeed. It's good to be with you this morning as we gather together in God's house to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. My name is Michael Bingham. I'm the pastor here at St. Mark Church. And in the name of Jesus Christ, I want to welcome you to our fellowship this morning. A few announcements I want to uh, speak to you about. First of all, you'll see we have multimedia uh, in our sanctuary today. So we're kind of running that today. Uh, went pretty well the nine, 9 o'clock service. Didn't have any hiccups, which means I just jinxed it and it's going to crash momentarily. But anyway... So you should see it uh, grow on us and, and uh, become smoother as we go, about, go along with it. Also, I want to take a moment uh, to say to the church, to all of you, uh, a thank you uh, for what we experienced here yesterday for the part that all of us together uh, played in that. And I will reference this somewhat in the sermon, but I'm, I'm referencing Hannah's funeral, which of course was in a, a, a very sad time. But... Uh, I dare say that's the largest group of people we've had on the campus here at St. Mark Church probably in its history. And all all of us together uh, played a a role in that in in large ways and small, uh, simple things like uh, setting up chairs or preparing uh, the the screen in the other room, the meal, the prayers. I appreciate your prayers, the family, uh, all of us together. And so I want to say that we did well given what we had to contend with. And so when I say thank you and I say we did well, I'm saying that to the glory of God um, because this is an awful situation, uh, but we've done the best we could uh, given that. So I just want to thank you for that, and I appreciate uh, all that you've done, and I know the family does as well. So having said that, let's move on. Uh, the Easter Experience study uh, is, uh, has begun actually during Sunday school, but also 7 p.m. tomorrow if you'd like to join us here. That's a video study. It asks the question, uh, what if everything that happened then changes everything now? And it's a powerful look at the at Holy Week, at what happened in the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, and then it does ask the question, what, what does that mean for us today? So it's, it's a great study. And then the Lenten uh, luncheon services are ongoing. John uh, Wesley United Methodist Church is the host church on Savannah Highway. So that begins at noon with lunch, and then we have a brief worship service at 12.30, and then they serve lunch again at 1. If you're available, it's, it's a great uh, experience. This Sunday, it'd be great because we want to show off a little bit because we're, the ho- you know, we're taking part in the service. The sermon, yeah, I'm preaching, but okay, so you can live through that. You'll survive today. Uh, but we have a group doing lunch, and that, that's great, so let's uh, support what's going on there. So, okay. I see. I didn't mention that. Thank you. I didn't, I'm so sorry. I uh, left the choir out. It's a very bad thing for the pastor to do. <clears throat> I'll talk to you later, choir. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, really, uh, so join us for that. Then uh, I want to remind you the cans on the end of the pews are for Redbird Missions. This helps out in Appalachia. We have a team going in May. So uh, take your change, drop in those cans, and you'll be helping support that ministry. So I want to encourage you to do that. And then Susie wants to, to bring an announcement to us. Good morning. Morning. The UMW, United Methodist Women, is having their annual dinner on March the 19th. It's slipping up on us. Um, We have tickets available. The information is in in your bulletin. It's spaghetti, um, salad, bread, dessert, and tea if you eat in. I encourage you all to eat in and let's have fellowship with the dinner. We do have takeout. If you come to early service, you may not want to eat at 10 o'clock, but if you live close by and want to come back and have dinner with us, we encourage you to do that. All the money goes to missions, and um, I guess that's it. Uh, We'll have tickets on sale um, after church, and please join us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, are there uh, celebration of life and covenant? Are there birthdays or anniversaries you'd like to celebrate at this time? Yes. Your dad's birthday today? Ken, you were hiding that from me, weren't you, brother? (laughs) Does anyone else have a birthday today? All right, can uh, we sing happy birthday to Mr. Kim? Miss Ken, that color of pink looks good on you. <laughs> Are there any other birthdays, anniversaries you'd like to celebrate? Is that it? 
All right, now what we're getting ready to do is kind of what I refer to as a worship video and with our multimedia, it's something that we can do. And so we may have a particular theme. It may be a season of the year, Mother's Day, Father's Day, this type of thing. Uh, so this one has a particular point it wants to make. So uh, let's see something about inviting people to church. church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edwards, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. Okay, here we are. Let's center down on what's important is to worship God in spirit and truth. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit and bless us as we're gathered here this day through the power of your presence and the presence of the risen Christ, that we may leave this place encouraged and enthused to serve you and our neighbor in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of praise is How Great Thou Art, number 77.
Please be seated. Let's join together in the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with transforming joy what you say to us today. Amen. The scripture today is from Luke, the sixth chapter, the twelfth through the sixteenth verses. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, who he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you, Edie. Let us pray. Gracious God, we have heard your word and we have heard of your son's need for prayer. Help us to pray in his name and to seek your will in all that we do. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so you see immediately uh, in this text a, a paradox that the early church was well aware of and, and fond of writing about and speaking about. And it is that in this text we have Jesus praying. And yet, Jesus hears our prayers. Now, a paradox is when two things appear to be somewhat mutually exclusive, or at least it's impossible for each of them to be true, and yet the Scripture uh, throws them out there as, and, and holds them up to us, affirms them as both being true. And oftentimes the Scripture does this without really bothering to explain that, and that's what's going on here. Now, how is it that the one who hears prayer uh, stands in the need of prayer? And, 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 and I, you know... We have to deal with that. We have to deal with the fact Jesus is fully human and fully divine. And I dare say that one of the lessons that you and I need to take from this as those that would follow after Jesus is, if Jesus needs to pray, I need to pray. If Jesus needs prayer, we need prayer. And it begs the question, why is Jesus praying here? And what is it that he is praying for? And so I want us to examine that. It appears that in and through prayer... Jesus decides to choose 12 persons from uh, out among those that are following him, his disciples, for a particular role in ministry, and he dubs them apostles. And that word apostle implies one who is sent out on a particular mission. So it would be as if I ask you to go to the store and purchase something for me, and I gave you the money to do that. So I've acted you to go out and act as my agent and, 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 to, and to do something for me. I've authorized you to do this. That's, that's the role here of an apostle, one who is sent in the name of the sender in order to act with the authority given them by the sender. And that's what an apostle is. So there are at least 72 disciples. We know that because that's the number Jesus sends out. He sends out that many. So there are at least 72 and Jesus chooses 12, and then he dubs them apostles. And evidently, in and through prayer, Jesus developed this concept. Now, Jesus prayed, but we still have to deal with Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Think about that for a minute. And then let's go on here and, and look at this in light of this verse here. And what I want to talk about here is, is what prayer is, or amongst the things that prayer is. Now, understand, my friends, there have been many books written on prayer. And I do not, for a single moment, uh, plan in a 20-minute sermon to exhaust all that prayer is. Okay, so this is not an exhaustive examination of what prayer is, but I think it's the, the, some things, it is some things, that prayer is. And amongst the things that prayer is are these things I'm about to list, and you've got some blanks there uh, on your insert, and I hope you'll follow along with me, and I pray that you find this beneficial. 
And so the first thing I want to say here about prayer, that prayer is, is prayer is a gift and a task. And I want you to write that down on your insert. Prayer is a gift and a task. Now, if I can talk to the men for just a minute, guys, uh, as sort of like your dad gives you a shovel as a gift. Here, son, is a shovel. And by the way, there's a hole I need dug. You know? Guys, you kind of, you're hanging with me. It might not have been a shovel, but you've been there. And, and, and for the women of the church, if I can speak to you for just a moment, if the man in your life, your husband, presented you with, I don't know, a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> now, guys, I'm talking to the guys now. If you have a wife, girlfriend, you need to jot down here this little side note. This isn't with a sermon, but you need to write down, never give your significant other a gift that plugs in. Okay, guys, you hanging with me? Don't do that, okay? That's how that's read. I'm giving you a gift, but there's a task attached to it. Uh-uh, we don't like that. That's what the gift of prayer is. And, 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 and to stop being facetious for just a moment, prayer is a beautiful gift that God has given us, this capacity to commune with the Lord God Almighty. To enter into a conversation with our Creator is a beautiful gift, a beautiful gift. And yet it is a task that we must work at and we must give it effort and we must focus upon it and give it time. I have literally sweated in prayer with God Almighty. Literally. And yet I celebrate the gift of prayer and this capacity to go before God in prayer. So prayer is both a gift and a task. Prayer is rest and work. And I want you to write that down on your insert. It's rest and work. And I know that sounds paradoxical as well. Prayer is restful, and you know what that's like. You've taken time out of your life, and you've gone to a quiet place, and it's just sort of like you, you unplug, and you decompress. And it feels so good when we're able to do that. Being able to rest in prayer is a beautiful thing, a God-given gift that we have, this And you know and I know that we need that in this world in which we live, which is so noisome and so loud at times. And yet, it's work. This idea of sweating in prayer and, and, and the idea of work. Jesus goes aside, which is his custom. We know that from Scripture. And he, and he goes aside and he prays through the night about this thing that he's getting ready to embark on, this part of his ministry. And he's working at that. It takes effort. It takes effort to pray like that. It is work. And if you don't work at prayer, I want to tell you something. It's, it's like if you don't work the muscles of your body, uh, they lose their capacity to do work. And so it is with prayer. Another thing about prayer that I want to point out is both individual and corporate. And I want you to write that down, individual and corporate. And I want to, I want to pick on somebody for just a moment. And, and I did this, and it worked out real well in the previous service. So we'll see how the 11 o'clock stacks up, okay? Jackie, did you pray for me this week? Thank you. As you know what I am referring to, Hannah, Hannah passed away this week, and many of you have told me you prayed for me, and we prayed for the family. That's corporate prayer. Okay, corporate prayer includes me praying before you and leading us in prayer, yes. But there is also the sense that corporate prayer is when we pray for other people, when we intercede for someone with the Lord God Almighty in prayer. Corporate prayer is a beautiful thing. It allows us to tap into the power of prayer through others, and it increases the efficacy, the, the efficiency of prayer. It's power to, to work in the world. And I coveted your prayers this week, and I needed your prayers. And the Warren family needs our prayers right now. And so prayer is intensely personal and individual. And we step aside and we pray alone with God. In fact, that's how Jesus Christ encourages us to pray, to go alone into a closet and pray in secret. And so we go and we be alone in prayer and it's an individual thing that we do. And yet it is also corporate as we pray for one another. So prayer is individual and corporate. It's a gift and a task. It's rest and it's work. It's individual and it's corporate. And then... It's foundational and formational. Prayer is foundational 
and formational. Now, if you've ever uh, been a part of building a building, and I, I mean everything from a shed out in the back of your yard to something as large as this church or one of the large high-rise type buildings downtown, when you build a building, foundation is everything. It's everything in a building. Your building can't stand without a firm foundation, and a well-set cornerstone is the first part of the foundation of a building. And so it is that when we seek to accomplish something for the Lord God Almighty, we better, in a foundational way, pray about that. And that's what Jesus is doing here. He goes aside to do something foundational. He is about to enter into a new part of his ministry. Now you know and I know that his ministry on earth ended at the cross of Calvary, his resurrection and his ascension. And this is a big step along that way. And Jesus steps aside and in a foundational way, he prays about what it is that he is about to undertake. And it appears in, in this prayer Perhaps, and, and, and understand now, I'm going out on a limb here a little bit because I don't pretend to know precisely the mind of Christ here because the scriptures don't open that up to us. But it appears here that in some, in some way, Jesus came to this conclusion about 12 and which 12? Uh, maybe not, maybe I already knew. But foundationally, Jesus is praying. And then prayer is formational. Prayer is formational. We are formed in prayer. As we pray to the Lord God Almighty, we are formed in that prayer. Prayer changes us. Prayer shapes us. God speaks to us in prayer and moves and directs us, usually, typically, through a still, small voice. And I know some of you right now are going, I don't know what voice he's talking about. And if that's what you're kind of saying to yourself, I invite you to go pray more. Because you haven't prayed enough if you've not felt that guidance from the Holy Spirit in prayer. Where we pray and we pray and God forms and moves and directs and shapes us as we pray. As we pour out our souls to the Lord God Almighty. It's an opportunity for God to form us. And then let's be clear theologically here. When we say that prayer is formational within the will of God. There is a real sense theologically that as his will is realized in the world around us, that God himself allows us to form out how that will works its will out in the world. There is a sense in which we, through prayer and petition, are able to be formative toward the will of God and how God's will it works its way out. Now, not always, and not always, and God does not have to listen to us in the sense of changing his will. That doesn't always happen. He always answers our prayer and he does always hear us. But our formative efforts there, we don't always get what we want. But God does allow that. And so while prayer is formative toward us, it is also formative in the way it works out in the world. So backing up and, and repeating this, Prayer is a gift and a task, rest and work, individual and corporate, foundational and formational. Prayer is our words to God and the word of God to us. And I want you to write that down. That'll take you a moment. Prayer is our words to God. And that's exactly what it seems. Now I know there are prayers that don't necessarily come out in, in real words. Sometimes it's sort of a groaning, and, 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 and the scriptures talk about that, where I don't even have words. This past week, I prayed those prayers, where I just, I, just, I just did. And I know God heard the desire of my heart in spite of the fact that my, my mouth, my mind, could not formulate that in words. At the same time, prayer is the word of God to us. Now, understand when I say the word of God there, understand theologically that that's a broad term there. We have the Word of God as in this scripture text here. This is the Word of God. But to the extent that the words that are coming out of my mouth right now are, comport themselves and, 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 and are guided by scripture, to that extent my words becomes the Word of God and not to the same level as scripture. I, I can't contradict scripture. But to the extent that I'm being obedient to the will of God, then, then the words of my mouth become the Word of God. Just as the songs that come forth from the choir can be the word of God in song. 
And so it is that as we pray to the Lord and we pour out our words to God, and, and if we'll take the time in prayer and we'll work at prayer and we'll rest in prayer so that, so that we can then hear God's word to us, that's oftentimes that still small voice, that gentle nudge that God gives us as he reveals his word to us as we pray. And this is so important, so important in our lives. Now prayer, lastly, there, the last big point I want to make here, is prayer is wrestling with God and resting in God. Wrestling with God and resting in God. Now oftentimes we get a little nervous uh, when we want to talk about contending with or wrestling with God. But you know, Jacob, Israel, that name is Yisrael, uh, has within it the idea uh, that Israel contended or wrestled with God. That's what that word means in Hebrew. So the Israel, Israel, the word Israel, means that. And we are to be wrestling with God. We are to go to God and be willing to say, God, I don't like what's going on here, I assure you. I prayed that way in the case of Hannah Warren. I wrestled with God about that, and I, and I have. And, and, and I shared that yesterday in the funeral, not to re-preach that. But we at times wrestle with God. And then prayer, though, is a resting in God. This idea that we can simply lay down our cares and our burdens and rest in the Lord God Almighty to rest within our communion with Him and our communication with Him to just be able to breathe and relax and rest in God, knowing that He is God and we are His. And this is a beautiful thing. So prayer is many things, and among them are, are these things that prayer is that we learn here about what's going on. Now, about Judas, if we go back to Judas who became a traitor... And you know, in one sense, it is entirely true that we could say, well, maybe that didn't work out so well for Jesus because one of the twelve was, became a traitor. Maybe, maybe that didn't work out. But in another way, my friends, you know and I know that in order for the cross of Calvary to take place and for us to experience salvation, it was necessary that Judas betray Jesus. So I don't know how to deal with that exactly, and I'll leave that out there for you to pray about. Now, a couple of things I want to say about prayer. If, if you want to write this down, you might find this helpful. I want you to write down the word push somewhere on your sheet there. Write down push. And that is pray until something happens. Okay? Remember to have a push prayer. Pray until something happens. Now, I get, as pastor, I, I get a significant number of people who come to me. Maybe they have a decision in their life. It may be a, a rather large decision, decision. It typically is. Is it time to retire? Should I take this new job? Is this person here, is that the man for me or the woman for me? You know, those kinds of questions that I get sometimes uh, from people. And what people really want is, you know, they, they sort of want to pray until God walls off one of the doorways in front of them and there's now there's only one door. Now, I can say that with authority because I've prayed that prayer a lot. You know, I don't want God to give me choices. I want him just to tell me, you know, I want him to treat, him, treat me like I'm stupid. Go through that door, dummy, you know, and just kind of shove me through that. I want to use that as an example. Let's say that I'm praying about something in my life, and I have a direction to go, let's say, in ministry. And let's say I'm standing here, and, and what I perceive to be happening is that God wants me to perhaps either go down these steps and out, or maybe God wants me over there. And I pray, and I don't really get a clear indication, really. I don't feel real confident that I've gotten a clear indication. And so I may reach out to other people, and I may have people praying for me, and I still don't get that clear answer. That's when people come to the pastor. And they oftentimes want me to sort of stand in for God and tell them what to do. And that, that becomes difficult. You may have been in this sort of situation. And what I'm going to tell you what God wants us to do at that point is to do this. And to continue to pray, understanding that if this was a misunderstanding, if I am not really being obedient, even though I think I am, that God's going to let me know that I should be over there. And so then, if that isn't what's happening, and instead I feel a sense of affirmation, or at least that God is not condemning what I'm doing, perhaps I will continue along this pathway as I seek to serve God in this new form of ministry. And so I end up 
continuing on and seeking God's blessing because we don't always get the clear-cut answer that we want from God. So we pray until something happens, but sometimes what happens is we begin the journey. We begin the journey. And then the last thing I want to share with you kind of about prayer, just in kind of in summation here today. I used to say as pastor, I, I did, and I used to say, well, if you're going to pray about it, don't worry. And if you're going to worry, don't pray about it. But I want to be honest with you. I can't live that out. See, I, I'm a worrier. I like, I like to worry. I, I take my worries. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not proud of that or anything, but I'm a worrier. And so, yes, I'd pray about something, and then I'd worry about it. So I, if I told you if you're going to pray about it, don't worry about it, I can't live up to that. And so I don't want to tell you to do something that I can't do. And so here's how I've sort of dealt with that. I've got a better way of saying that. I like to pray big and worry small. And if you want to write that down, if you find that helpful, I like to pray big and worry small. Because I do find that in praying about something, I can worry about it a lot less. I can't not worry about it because, you know, I'm a worrier. But I can worry about it a lot less because I pray. So pray big, worry small. I like that one. And so these are a few things that we can affirm about what prayer is. Prayer is, is, is a conversation with God and, and this willingness to pour out our soul before God. It is a gift and a task. It is rest and it is work. It is individual and corporate. It is foundational and formational. Prayer is our words to God and also the word of God to us. Prayer is wrestling with God and resting in God. And so I invite you, as we move forward in Lent together, to begin to live out your life in prayer. You'll notice the title of the sermon is Living the Life Prayer. And so I've got a series of sermons in, in Lent about living this life. And when I say living the life, the life I'm talking about living is the life that Jesus Christ came to give to you and me. Jesus said, I came that, they, that you might have life and have it abundantly. So this abundant life, that's why the word life is capitalized, involves some things on our part. And so in the coming weeks, we'll be looking at aspects of the Christian life, the disciplines, if you will, of the Christian life. And the reason that prayer is first is because prayer is so foundational. And so if you don't have a vibrant and living prayer life, I want to challenge you this week to get busy in prayer. Now, I want to tell you a story from my own life. Many years ago, I was given, this before my call to the ministry, I was given an opportunity to pray for a group of people, and I took that very seriously. And at that time in my life, I was working a second shift job, and so I signed up for something like 1.30 in the morning or 2 o'clock, I don't remember, some, some weird hour like that, because frankly, I, I knew that I could still be awake. You know, I was just staying up a little late. And, and so somebody else wouldn't have to set an alarm clock and get up out of bed in the middle of the night. So, you know, I got things ready there in the house, and I got a chair to sit in. I had a list of names and things I was supposed to be praying for, and I took it really seriously because I was getting, getting really involved in my Christian life, and I was taking that very seriously. So I sit down in the chair, and, man, I start praying. And I prayed, and I prayed, and the sweat rolled, and I, I mean, I, man, I prayed. I was supposed to pray for 30 minutes. I signed up for a 30-minute prayer slot, and I prayed, and I prayed, and I knew I'd probably gone over, you know, because I'd been praying so hard, and I looked, and it had been about five minutes. <laughs> and I was like, ooh, it's going to be a long half hour. <laughs> Prayer is like that, my friends. It's hard work. It's not easy. It takes practice. But you know, if we practice prayer, it gets to the point where I don't feel right if I'm not praying. Just walk along through life, praying to the Lord. Letting Him know what I'm thinking and waiting on Him to tell me what He, what he, what he wants me to know. So I invite you this week to pray. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we give thanks to you again for the gift of prayer. And we pray, O oh Lord, in this coming week that you would help us turn our lives toward you in prayer. Help us to be a praying people and help us to know that in prayer is life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to this his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with him and one another. 
Now, friends, in addition to the uh, bread up here, we have some bread that is gluten-free. And if some of you need gluten-free bread, when you come forward for communion, if you let us know that, we'll make sure that takes place. We'll get you that bread. Now we're going to turn to our time of prayer together. And a part of our prayers today, because it's Holy Communion, we'll be praying a prayer of confession. We'll confess our sin to the Lord and seek His forgiveness. And that's entirely appropriate before we come forward to communion together. Obviously, I've mentioned uh, throughout our service today, uh, Hannah Warren and her death, and so let's remember the Warrens in our prayers, and also Stacy Power, who's doing much better. He's been at rehab, but uh, continues to be at times a little confused, but uh, God willing, he'll come home later uh, this week. He's scheduled to come home on Thursday, so let's remember Mr. Stacy in our prayers. And then uh, young Matthew Tate, uh, that's Nancy Strickland's great-grandson, who was born with a congenital heart defect. He's already had one open heart surgery. He's going to have surgery in the morning. This is a, a part of a series of surgeries that he will undergo in his life to correct uh, this problem that he was born with. So let's remember young Matthew's doing very well, has done well thus far, so we pray that God would continue to bless uh, young Matthew and help him to grow uh, stronger and, and to be healed uh, through these surgeries. With that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, as we come before you today, we are mindful of our own sinfulness, Lord, and our need for salvation and grace and redemption, Lord. And as we enter this time of Lent together, help us to be a people that are willing to wear sackcloth and ashes in mourning for the sins that we have committed because we have been stiff-necked and hard-hearted. And help us, Lord, to pick up what you would have us to pick up and lay aside what you would have us lay aside to do your will and to seek your will and not our own. And Lord, we know that you're quick to forgive us, and we seek that forgiveness now in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray also today for the Warren family and for the Power family, for young Matthew Tate, Lord, and we pray that in each of these circumstances that your grace might be sufficient. And we pray, Lord, that you bless these persons and bless this church as, as we grieve and we mourn, O Lord, and bless us in this day and help us to be faithful servants. And we pray all of this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us offer unto God his tithes and our offerings.
We give thanks to you, Almighty God, for all with which you've blessed us, even to this day. Receive now these, your tithes and offerings, and we pray that you would bless them to do your work in the world, and that they would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The great thanksgiving that I will be using is uh, adapted somewhat from the one that you'll see presented before you. Uh, the one I'm using is from the book of worship, and it's for Lent. Uh, I think you'll be able to follow along. I think it's self-explanatory enough. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights, you bore up the ark on the waters and saved Noah and his family and made covenant with every living creature on earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for forty days and forty nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for forty days and forty nights, and on your holy mountain he heard your still, small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your Spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted forty days and forty nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during forty days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, this is the body of Christ broken for you. This is the cup of salvation poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. I'd like to ask those I've asked to assist with communion to come forward at this time.
body of Christ broken for you. The 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 blood of Christ shed for you. be given a broken piece of bread and dip that and eat that. The altar rail will be open for prayer. I invite you to come forward now as directed by our ushers.
We've made a change in our closing hymn uh, at this time. It's going to be in remembrance of me. So let's stand together and sing to the glory of God in remembrance of me. Receive now this benediction. I go out in peace and serve your God and your neighbor in all that you do. And may the blessing of Almighty God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you now and evermore until we meet again. Amen.